And now will you stand with me for the reading of the Holy Gospel? The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When some were speaking about the temple, how it was adorned with beautiful stones and gifts dedicated to God, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. They asked him, Teacher, when will this be, and what will be the sign that it is about to take place? And he said, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he, and the time is near. Do not go after them. When you hear of wars and insurrections, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first, but the end will not follow immediately. Then he said to them, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be great earthquakes and in various places famines and plagues. And there will be dreadful portents and great signs from heaven. But before all this occurs, they will arrest you and persecute you. They will hand you over to synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and governors because of my name. This will give you an opportunity to testify so make up your minds not to prepare your defense in advance, for I will give you words and a wisdom that none of your opponents will be able to withstand or contradict. You will be betrayed even by parents and brothers, by relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. You will be hated by all because of my name, but not a hair of your head will perish. By your endurance, you will gain your souls. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Amen. As a pastor, uh, I can tell you that we pastors take great comfort in many words uh, of Scripture. Uh, this is very highly ranked among those words uh, where God promises that he will give you words to speak, but you have to understand the Bible in context. That's very important. So are there any kings uh, or governors here? Man, I should have prepared. Uh, <laughs> no, I, <laughs> I did prepare. I prepared uh, something on our gospel uh, lesson today that I hope will be a blessing to you. Because I know uh, that this truth is has been a blessing to me. Because when... I encounter uh, the Word of God, I find that I'm always asking questions. My, uh, my interest and curiosity is often piqued by uh, what it is that I, uh, that I read in the Scriptures. But I, even after looking at things, even after studying, even after prayer, I sometimes walk in a way thinking, man, I don't know 100% what this, what this means. What is it trying to say? And our passage today promises that God is one who will give a gift of a wisdom that can't be refuted. A word that is so powerful and true that no one will be able to stand against it. And at the same time, he promises persecution. He promises suffering. He promises uh, a world of difficulty. And I don't know about you, but in my own life, I, I feel like I have a first world level of these types of problems. You know what I mean? I came home yesterday from vacation. That's definitely a first world problem to, uh, to begin with. It was 45 degrees in my house. And I'm feeling like that was second world problem. When we, uh, when we look at uh, the difficulties in our lives, though, most of the difficulties that we have, the things that we, that we curse and that we struggle with, we realize that they might not be persecution here. They may not be the end of the world here. But m much of what the world endures today, the moment that we go outside of our own comfort zones and we look into the uh, lives of the people living uh, here in Ashland County, as we mentioned earlier today, um, for those kids who are in the foster care system, they're suffering on a whole other level. When we look around the world at the persecution that the church faces, there are Christian people who are suffering on a whole other level. 
And the world, as it looks around at the evil that is perpetrated, uh, whether it is uh, epidemic proportion problems like bullying, like uh, homelessness, whether it is um, these school shootings that just continue uh, and continue. These are pretty close to end-of-the-world tier problems. And if we aren't looking inside uh, of our own hearts and wondering what God is up to, then we are not walking around with our eyes open. We are not living as Christian people. Because I promise you this, that even the world is walking around uh, with its eyes open, and they look to the church. They look to the promises of a God who claims to be good, who claims to love, and they wonder, why just thoughts and prayers? Let's look at this passage and see what the Lord has to speak to us uh, today about those types of struggles. You see, Jesus is asked by the disciples a, uh, a question about the temple. For them, the temple uh, in Jerusalem is the world. It is actually built to be a microcosm uh, of the world. And I won't go into great detail about it uh, because I could, and I love uh, talking about this. But suffice to say, it is the center of, uh, of worship. It is not just their church. It is, a, uh, it is emblematic of all of the created universe, uh, and it is their way of participating uh, symbolically in the spiritual aspect of life. Right? Just as we come to church today, and we stand and we sit, and like, we, like I said earlier, the reason that we do those things, the reason that we participate in the ways that we do, when you see all of these strange traditions, and you wonder, like, why do they do that? That's really weird. Um, it's because what we're attempting to do in church is to embody, uh, to, in a way, dramatize, to live out in a small way, not the realities of, of paying the bills and fixing the leaky faucet and making sure the car has an oil change and vacuuming the floors, Right? That we live out just fine. But the spiritual truth that is the foundation of the world, that we come to participate in uh, here at church. And we do so in a way that is unlike any other aspect of life. And so church, it's right that it's different. It's right that it's a little bit weird. Because we're not uh, doing life the way that the world does life, but we're doing life in the way that God has uh, told us, that he has promised. There is a spiritual reality behind everything something which we do not see, and yet he gives us access to. And that thing, that uh, is embodied in the temple of Jerusalem for all of Judaism. And it's that thing that Jesus says, uh, take a look, because it's not going to be left standing. The way that you understand the world and the, uh, the way that you understand God, the way that you imagine that God works uh, in uh, temporal life, in your day-to-day -day life, is going to be overturned. And what is going to happen will not leave you with anywhere to stand. This is uh, what Jesus is saying to his disciples. It is a very significant event that Jesus is talking about. He's not saying, man, it's a bummer that this beautiful building is going to get wrecked. Uh, <laughs> that would be only the surface. But what that building, what, that, uh, the, what the temple represents is everything to those people. It is their very identity, and it will not be left standing. And they ask Jesus a question. They say, Lord, when will this happen, and what will be the sign that it's about to take place? Because you know what? The first thing you're, that uh, you, and I think this is a reasonable question. If I said, guess what, everyone? This building, the room, it's going to fall down. You're like, when? How fast do I have to run for the door? Because you don't want it to fall down on top of you. You don't want it to be destroyed uh, along with the temple. And so it's a reasonable question by the disciples. But the problem with the disciples is this. They don't ask the right questions. You know, for, uh, for, for me, and I imagine maybe for you as well, when you come to the Scriptures and you come uh, to the Word of God, you find yourself asking all kinds of questions. You find yourself, uh, when you engage with the Scriptures, wondering, what does this mean? What is, uh, what is it that God is bringing into being? What is it that God wants me to do with my life or with my day or with my family? What is it that God uh, is looking for 
or uh, attempting to bring into being through his word and through his work in the world. But often we don't end up with the same answers uh, or the answers to the questions that we ask. Instead, we, we kind of receive a different, a different revelation, a different answer. And we don't get from God what we're asking for, but rather God gives us what it is that we actually need. And so it happens with the disciples. You see, the disciples, they want to know, um, well, when is this all going to take place? They want to know uh, tomorrow's news today. They want the bulldog edition, right? I don't know. Uh, that's a strange practice in the world uh, that uh, I'm not sure that they do it on the uh, Ashland uh, community newspaper here. But uh, back home in Southern California, you know, we do things like this, apparently. You could get the Bulldog Edition newspaper, which is Sunday morning newspaper, but you get it Saturday. Don't ask, because I have no idea. It just sounds so dumb, and yet you could do it, but it costs extra money. So, <laughs> so God bless them. They figured out a way to do it, you know. You get Sunday's news today. Uh, and how in the world could you sell a product like that? That's absolutely impossible. Well, they got profits writing for them? Of course they don't. <laughs> Instead, they're taking advantage of the fact that, you know what? They know exactly what it is that you want. You want to know what's going to happen before it happens. And when we hear about the work of God in the world, how much of our time and energy as Christian people is devoted to looking off to the future and saying, I know there's going to be an end. Um, when is it coming? We want to read things like the, the, the Revelation and to decode it so that we might understand where we fit in it. We want to uh, understand what it is that God is working so we can be ahead of the curve. We can, be, uh, we can have it in our minds in advance and take comfort in the fact that we have special knowledge of God that nobody else gets. And the disciples are looking for this very same thing. But God doesn't uh, give them the, the answer. Jesus doesn't uh, simply say to them, okay, it's going to happen on August the 25th, such and such, X, Y, and Z. Here's the signs. You're going to see uh, these people marching in from the north, and when that happens, boy, oh boy, um, you better start running. Instead, he gives them uh, the truth. He tells them, look, there's going to be all kinds of things coming. You're going to hear of all of the terrible things uh, that the world can bring to bear, uh, and they're all going to be coming here. There are going to be wars. There are going to be famine. There is going to be uh, insurrection. There's going to be struggle and pain and hardship. And Jesus doesn't lie and shy away from telling the truth to his disciples. Jesus isn't about covering over a world that is filled with all of the difficulties that uh, they were experiencing at the time or that we experience today and pretend as though it weren't happening to paint a beautiful picture uh, in dark times. You know, Jesus uh, is very straightforward. It's bad. It could get worse. And then he begins to tell them the answer to a question which they didn't ask. So what about them? Because this question matters more than you can imagine. You know, you can look around in the world and you can complain uh, about the way that things are going. Things aren't the way they used to be. We're all terrified the robots are going to take over. Uh, who knows if we're going to need universal basic income or this, that, or the other. And you can paint whatever apocalyptic scenario you'd like. It's robots today. It used to be zombies. Heaven knew it was the Soviets before that, right? Um, you can paint whatever type of, of terrible scenario you can imagine. And it's plausible. Like things are, are difficult. And our Lord isn't hiding from this. Our Lord I isn't simply offering uh, up the idea that our thinking and our praying are sufficient. But instead he says, you must act. You must live. You must do. You must be Christian people. And in this way, God will bring about everything that he desires to bring about. You see, what the world doesn't understand and what the disciples don't understand and what we ourselves generally don't understand or maybe we often forget is that what God is doing in this life is not simply about bringing about an end. It's not about a date. It's not about a time. 
It's about a goal. It's about where God is taking us and not when we get there. You see, the end that Jesus talks about, it, he says, is the telos, which is the, the Greek word uh, th that I think it's best translated as goal, the target. It's what Jesus is taking us to. Jesus wants to t turn our attention away from the calendar and the clock, away from all of the suffering and the belief that, well, God will cut all of this short, but to remember that in the end, God overcomes that there is nothing that we see today, nothing that is happening in the world around us, no amount of suffering or hardship or pain that God will not and is not redeeming through his son, Jesus Christ. That, that is the goal. It's not a time or a place. It is Jesus Christ. It is redemption. It is so that all of the suffering and all of the sin that we perpetrate, that we uh, commit ourselves and that we are powerless to stop others from committing, that as we offer up our thoughts and prayers uh, before the newscast, knowing that there's not a dang thing that we can do about it, we believe we have a God who is bigger. A God who is stronger and more powerful than this life. A God who is bigger and stronger and more powerful than death. Bigger and stronger and more powerful than you or I or this world or anything that will come. And that things, though they may be bad and though they may get worse, God is faithful to bring us through them. Because God is a redeemer. You see, this is the, the grand confusion. This is the, the, the bad question that we're always looking to answer. And this is the answer that God is happy to give us in response. Lord, when? When will this all go away? When will I have a job? When will I have a home? When will I have food? When will I have peace? When will I have freedom from addiction? When will I have all of these things? And you want, I know, a day on the calendar and a moment on the clock. God has given you Christ. And Christ is the end of all things. Just as he was the end of the temple, uh, he is the end of all of our hopes of escaping. All of our hopes of, of running away from all of this from all of the pain and difficulty. Um, he is the beginning of life. Let us pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, we struggle in the face of uncertainty and suffering in this life. And we are right to do it because we know, Lord, how much of it we have brought into being through our actions and through our inaction. And Lord, as we see uh, the suffering that this world uh, laments about, uh, that they taunt uh, the church with, Lord, we continue to place our hope in you. Not because you have ordained a moment uh, that we can point to where we will be free of this, but you have granted us freedom through Christ. Lord, let that freedom uh, abound within our lives today, Lord, and bring us at last to the end of all sickness, sorrow, pain, and death, that promised end who is your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen.